Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Pius. I think um, Dennis has a good question, and it kind of um, tacks on to the end of one that um, uh, one of the other um, presentations gave, um, asking, um, as we're essentially going after ammonia with these different practices, um, have you considered the formation of greenhouse gases um, as as we're doing these practices, either from biofilters or pond covers? So, how would you comment on that? Uh, well, uh, I, 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 is that to me long? Yes. Uh, well, uh, we we didn't uh, actually uh, look at uh, the, the the other. Uh, uh, gases that come together with ammonia. Uh, but you, when you have it covered, for example, you, you're trapping everything. Uh, all the gases are, are combined. Now, when you look at uh, nitrification, uh, uh, denitrification, uh, we haven't looked at uh, uh, what kind of greenhouses are likely to come from uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those practices. Okay, uh, Jessica. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a question from you, from Mark Reese, looking at in some areas um, with higher emissions, what sort of deposition rates um, are we commonly going to see? The, the deposition rates in Rocky Mountain National Park are only about three to four pounds of nitrogen per acre. But because of the sensitivity of the uh, ecosystem, that small amount ends up making a big difference. And I would additionally comment that, I mean, years ago, and I'm, I'm young, but I'm dating myself, when, when I was learning nutrient management planning in Virginia, we were taught that, I mean, from 10 to 15 pounds of atmospheric deposition on the East Coast was fairly common and that we should a plan for that is as part of our nutrient management planning process. Essentially, that's the natural background uh, that we were looking Ron, at. Sorry, Ron. There was also a paper out of Alberta from the uh, research group with uh, uh, at Lethbridge with the Beef Research Center there. They, they documented about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre deposited directly downwind from feedlots, so very close by. And so uh, in that case, uh, that if that's a farmer next door, that might actually be an asset. Okay. Well, I guess this is a question for, for you, Jessica, and, and, and possibly for Randy, is what effect does live ground cover have on ammonia volatility? And I'm not sure if that's during application um, or during the land application process. Jessica, you want to try that one? Well, I'm trying to understand the question. I think that that means growing plants at the time of ammonia application is what I'm assuming. And uh, I'm not sure that there's documented reduction levels for that. But it, it does seem clear that that would serve as a buffer, that that would help to uh, reduce ammonia loss because the wind, the effect of wind speed at the surface where the ammonia is would be reduced because of the plants growing there. I think with so some of it, sorry, I was going to say I think with some of it also enhance the available surface area for deposition as well. Uh huh. As well as plant uptake. Um, here comes another similar question from before, talking about this concept of, uh, of trading one issue for another. And, um, and I believe that's very important, is would direct injection trade fewer emissions um, for higher risk in terms of nitrates um, um, to groundwater? I think this is a really critical question, these trade-offs, and that when we evaluate BMPs, we cannot just focus on one compound of concern. 
that it's really important that we are aware of the trade-offs and make the best choices we can. And there are other examples too, like uh, we know that if we could afford to acidify a lagoon, that would reduce ammonia emissions, but it would also increase odor from that lagoon. And I think in addition to those kinds of trade-offs from one pollutant to another, it's also important to think of the whole system. So, for example, if we cover a lagoon, we will reduce ammonia emissions from the lagoon. But when that wastewater is applied to land, we're likely to get a lot more ammonia volatilized there than we would have if the lagoon had not been covered. So if we're just moving it around, then that's not really an effective BMP. We have to look at the whole system. Okay, now another question a little bit away from the livestock side is that we've been focusing on ammonia losses from, from specifically from the manure, but what can be done to reduce emissions um, from ammonia-based fertilizers? I think some of Pius's slides were sort of directed towards that and how they're applied. I, I, well, uh, Lon, I, I don't. I think, uh, especially, uh, you, you you cannot separate the two issues. Uh, whether it is fertilizer or, or or you know the nitrogen in fertilizer or in or in, uh, in a manure. I think basically uh, the same uh, method should work for both. In other words, uh, if you're going to reduce uh, loss. Into the uh, into the air from fertilizers, you have to, the best way is to incorporate them in the soil. That's true, but in addition, there are of course different fertilizer formulations. There are coated fertilizers, slow release fertilizers, or, or nitrification inhibitors too, uh, or um, and so that that. Those can also be used to try to get the nitrogen to the plants when the plants need them and not get it there too early and because then that increases loss. You know, the basic agronomic principles of apply just what you need and apply as close to the time that plants actually need them also will help to reduce ammonia loss from fertilizer. Okay, as we're starting to wrap up here, you'll see an, a new series of questions off to the right. If you could help um, answer those for us, that helps us definitely um, try to quantify the impact of these different programs and help us in the future. In the future. Here's one for you, Pius and um, Jessica. Um, why are we not focusing on developing BMPs that reclaim the ammonia um, for controlled reuse and controlled application? Go ahead, Bias. Well, I, uh, Lon, I, I think uh, that, that seems to be more the, the dilation uh, things are going now. And, and that's why uh, you, you find that uh, most of the, the conventional methods like uh, uh, nitrification, denitrification, where you basically convert uh, the, nitro the nitrogen into into uh, the gas, is not popular any, anymore. Uh, the, the idea is to package uh, the ammonia into a form uh, where you can uh, move it around to where it's not needed, to where it's needed more. So those that that's the direction I see things going. The trick will be to be able to do it economically. Uh, right. Livestock producers are pretty pressed uh, right now with super high input costs, and so everything, every BMP has got to make economical sense. But additionally, I mean, right now, at least our producers down south here, we're seeing more interest from non-livestock producers wanting that that animal ammonia and that um, animal nitrogen. Um, mm -hmm from manure products um, to help our row croppers with their high input costs. So I believe that there will be a potential return if the control technology isn't too expensive. 
that's true, huh? Uh, let's do one more question. Um, would the widespread use of anaerobic digesters likely result in a side benefit of reduced ammonia emissions? Uh, well, uh, I, I think uh, if, if no measures are taken uh, uh, on the effluent that's coming from anaerobic digesters, uh, you're more likely to see more ammonia emissions uh, than, if, than if the material was not anaerobically digested. Uh, this is because uh, most of the organic nitrogen will already have been converted into an ammonium form uh, that uh, would more easily be lost to the environment. So uh, the anaerobic digestion, digest, they have to be accompanied by some other kind of uh, best, manage, best management practices. Uh, where you have to deal with more uh, of the more easily lost ammonium in the effluent than in the manure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bingo. That's a, it's one of those that people have touted anaerobic digesters to take care of the odor and emissions and everything. And, and with ammonia, ammonium digesters really don't mix. Um, it's going to take an additional um, type of practice, either a cover to manage the, the digested effluent in a um, storage basin or looking at um, some way of controlling the ammonia loss during the application of that digested effluent. Because um, as Pius said, we've removed the carbon, um, so there's no place for that ammonia to stick. So it's going to more readily volatilize into the atmosphere after it's been through that digester. So it's, again, um, kind of the recurring theme here is as trade-offs when we talk about the BMPs. That, yeah, we got some odor control and we did hopefully take advantage of that um, produced methane, but the downside is going to be a, a, a material that is going to lose nitrogen faster than, than other um, manure liquids. I think you might also want to mention that this one, that's also an issue of swapping one pollutant for another as well because as you say you'll be producing methane but you're also going to be producing a lot of CO2 and uh, those have to go somewhere as well that get into the greenhouse gas issues again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so one more, Our Kevin Yanni was typing on one question that didn't pop up yet. Um, he's back at it. Um, uh, Pius, uh, when do we think that the, the publication will be available for folks to look at? Uh, uh, right now it's uh, in printing, so I, I think in the next, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, weeks uh, it, should be, it should be available uh, at, the web, uh, at the website. Okay. Okay. Um, probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, why not use the opposite strategy here and use composting to tie up the ammonia um, with carbon? Um, I'll go ahead and take a stab at this one. That's, that's a good strategy if you can find enough, um, uh, enough carbon to manage that compost system um, so that during the composting process when a lot of heat is generated, um, that we're not blowing off ammonia. Um, that's a very tricky balance um, to look at that during that um, degradation process that we're not throwing off more ammonia. It's very difficult to do. You're going to be composting with um, very high amounts of carbon to not have essentially a, a net loss of ammonia during that process. Um, and kind of back to the greenhouse question, um, Kevin Yanni um, from University of Minnesota um, definitely adds to the, the conversation of the nitrous oxide emissions and other greenhouse emissions definitely need to be looked at um, from biofilters. And I think that was a um, follows up on a question from earlier that we need to understand the other emissions, um, greenhouse emissions and other gas emissions, be them uh, volatile organic carbons um, when we look at um, these practices that here that we're talking about today with ammonia.
So with that, I guess i um, like to thank everybody for sticking around um, and for our first um, webcast from the um, air quality group as part of the livestock and poultry